as David said, um, tonight is um, brought to us by Queensland Genomics, um, previously um, um, known as the Queensland Genomics Health Alliance, so they underwent a bit of rebranding. Queensland Genomics is a good example of uh, where we're at, um, I guess, from a you know, systems uh, perspective with genomics. I think it was about five years ago, the Queensland government um, put aside $25 million to integrate genomics into uh, routine healthcare uh, across Queensland. So with this end goal, the team at Queensland Genomics have been taking a multi-pronged approach to uh, look at how we can make genomics mainstream. So that's been primarily through what they've called the, the flagship projects. So these are, I guess, disease specific uh, conditions, looking at testing in a, a whole range of conditions. But for example, uh, rare childhood dis disorders, uh, cardiac genetics, infectious diseases, um, and of course, cancer. Along with that though, has been um, a, a capabilities stream. So it's not, not, not much point saying, yeah, we're sure we can test for something, but you have to be able to use and integrate the technology uh, within our day-to-day -day, uh, healthcare. And so that's, that's quite a large part of the uh, Queensland Genomics project. So that's looking at the vast amounts of data that are generated from genomic testing, how we deal with that, how we process the bioinformatics. It goes well beyond just all the technical aspects of it. Uh, there are many ethical and social issues um, that need to be considered. And these are all being uh, studied uh, through this uh, generous grant from the, from the government. Where I fit in is the uh, education and workforce development arm. And so my substantive role at the moment is uh, teaching scientists um, how to uh, uh, read and interpret genomic information through a degree here at QUT. Uh, but I'm also um, involved in a number of other um, um, uh, projects uh, that Queensland Genomics uh, has uh, got off the ground, including this one. I'd also like to just take a quick opportunity to, take, to thank CheckUp tonight. CheckUp's uh, provided the administrative and um, IT support um, and also the governance oversight of this particular project. So myself, I'm a clinical geneticist. So I, I trained uh, here in Brisbane um, in paediatrics and decided um, that I was quite taken by genetics. And this was before the, the era of big genomics went to Sydney for a couple of years to further my specialty training, and then came back to Brisbane and, and uh, worked at uh, Genetic Health Queensland for over a decade before uh, undertaking a little bit of a sea change and now pursuing a life in academia. So my life now really is involved in um, uh, teaching, but I've also uh, got a couple of research projects on the, on the go. Um, and so it's really making the most of all that I've learned through my clinical career um, and being able to pass that knowledge on uh, to, to uh, all sorts of people, so scientists and clinicians like yourselves. Um, we're just gonna try Slido here. So what I would like to know is first of all, Has anyone here heard of Queensland Genomics? Now, forgive me if the technology is not working. But I'd like to know who of you out there has heard of Queensland, Queensland Genomics? So, Only one person, so that's um, um, not many. So hopefully tonight, um, this uh, talk and, and the follow-up webinars will give you some idea of the money that's being invested in uh, genomic technology. Um, and this money is being replicated across the country. So we've, it's not just a, a, a thing that's um, Queensland based, but there's a Melbourne genomics um, body um, and then the big ones are the Australian um, genomics um, based in Melbourne as well. So governments at all levels are uh, investing in, in technology. 
the numbers have just updated. We've now got 19 people um, who've heard of Queensland Genomics. So it's good that a number of people have heard of it. The next question I'd like to ask is, who is familiar with this document, Genomics in General Practice? So I apologize for the lag. So while we're waiting for those answers to come in, this document is really quite a nifty document. And I think it would be a valuable tool for you, those of you working in general practice. It's um, something that is put together by your college. Um, it uses, has used um, the brain's trust of a number of experts um, in genetics. And it's a little bit of a one-stop shop in a way. Um, say you're having to trawl through the internet looking for your, uh, your questions. Um, but essentially, um, most of the common genetic conditions are listed there. So if you have a patient um, who's worried about a common genetic condition or a common presentation of a genetic disorder, you can quickly look that up. Uh, but it also gives uh, information on um, testing and platforms, how they, work, how they work, what their limitations are, um, and some of the things that we're talking about tonight, such as screening um, and some caveats to, um, to, to testing. So if you're not familiar with this, um, as my poll says about 30% of you aren't, um, then I do encourage you just to hop onto um, the RACGP uh, website, um, download it and just uh, you know, keep it on, you know, in a handy place, just bookmark it. Um, for if you are seeing patients with genomic questions and genomic disorders, um, this is a good place to, to uh, start if you're un unfamiliar with um, the questions being asked or unsure of what the answer is or where to look for that matter. So what is all this genomics? And what on earth ever happened to genetics? So essentially genomics is a, a word that's really come about in the last uh, 10 or 15 years and in a way is uh, surpassing the term genetics and a lot of what we previously referred to as genetics is being um, sucked up by this term genomics. And it can be a bit of a pain to be honest um, because a lot of the time what we're talking about between genetics and genomics tends to be the same thing, um, but we've just invented a different, a, a new word. So every time we say something about genetics, we have to say something about genetics and genomics. Um, but I found this nice little definition, um, which is probably a little bit of an oversimplification, but it does get your head around the, the, the concept of genomics. And so what genomics is, is the study and the structure of the function of the genome. So that's basically all our DNA, how it uh, talks to each other, um, how it talk, and how it sort of encodes and, and makes our body and fu function. Of course, it does raise the question then, then, what's the genome? Well, the genome is just basically a complete set of our DNA. Now, DNA is not just genes, and that's why this term genomics, I guess, has been invented and is uh, being promulgated. Genes, um, technically speaking, are the protein coding very uh, protein coding regions within our uh, genome. Um, and there's only about 20,000 pairs of genes. And this only makes up about one or 2% of all of our DNA. So there's a lot of DNA out there that's not actually genetic uh, on a technical level. And so that's why we're using this term genomics. Now, a lot of what we talk about uh, tonight in the, and in the following two uh, webinars, I will uh, restrict to talking about genes, but we are finding out a lot about um, the bits in between the genes, uh, so the, the non-coding um, uh, DNA and RNA, which has a lot to do with the background, if you like. So this, um, whilst we used to think of it as, I guess, junk DNA, we're now learning that um, it's far from it. Um, and when you think about it, we're a bit naive to think 90% of our DNA would be junk, but it has a lot to do with how genes are regulated, how they're turned on, how they're turned off, um, how they react to each other and how they talk to the, each other. When we look at genetics, so that the definition of genetics, I guess, is being simplified. And this is a, a simplified definition here saying it's the study of hereditary and inherited diseases. Um, and following on from what I'm just saying, you, you could say, um, it could be the, the study of um, genetic, as in protein coding DNA disorders. But I think that 
is probably a concept that's being taken up by the term genomics. And this definition listed here, the study of hereditary, how things run through families and inherited disorders, is probably where we're going with the term genetics. So in this brave new world that we're living in, are there any other new words that we need to know about? Well, one word that's really uh, well and truly on the way out is mutation. So previously, when we thought about an error in our genetic makeup, we would call it an, a mutation. And what has occurred over the years is the word mutation has come to mean different things for different people. So for myself, um, as a clinician, I would often talk about a mutation as being something um, that was in the genetic material that caused disease. Whereas uh, scientists and researchers would think of a mutation as anything that was different from a, uh, the standard reference DNA. And so the language started to get a bit confused. And so the word mutations slowly being whittled away and replaced by this word variant. And certainly uh, genetic result reports are now talking about variants rather than mutations. And so what is a variant? Well, basically it's any alteration in our DNA. Um, now we're all different from each other, so therefore we've all got variants. When we're talking about uh, medical genomics, what we're interested in is, is that variant pathogenic, causing disease, or if it's not pathogenic. And so these are the terms you're likely to encounter if reading a genetic report or a genomic report, pathogenic variant or a non-pathogenic variant, also known as a polymorphism, um, polymorphism um, being used for a, a, a normal variant in the population. All this has come about through our increased ability to look at genes and chromosomes. So from about the 1950s, we're able to look at the chromosomes. Um, and these were um, a high level down a microscope uh, view. Then from the 1980s and 1990s, we started to uh, clone genes through the, um, the Human Genome Project. And we were able to see, I guess, single, single genes. And then around the late 1990s, early 2000s, technology started to come around where we were able to see the chromosomes in a little bit more um, detail. And so our testing from these beginnings has changed. So cytogenetics, where we looked at the packaging of the genes, the chromosomes, has now become cytogenomics because we're able to hone in at a greater magnitude into those chromosomes and look at them at a greater resolution. Gene analysis, well, previously it was looking at one gene at a time, essentially. Um, and instead of looking at one gene at a time, we're now looking, we can look at all the genes at once. And so we're going from this genetic level to a genomic level. And I won't forget the biochemical analysis either. They've, biochemistry's been um, streaks ahead of genetics in a way. But in um, the old days, and we're talking, you know, going back uh, several decades now, we used to only be able to assay one biochemical analyte at a time. But through technologies such as man, uh, um, tandem, mass spectrometry, tandem mass spectrometry, excuse me, um, we're able to look at dozens and dozens of analytes simultaneously. So this is a table summarizing what I've just said. So in the old genetic world, from a biochemical level, we're looking at things, you know, just one compound in isolation, whereas things like tandem mass spec, we're able to look at heaps of things at once. I'll skip down to a molecular genetics level, saying a sequencing, that's what we call first generation sequencing. Um, this, was a, this enabled us to look at one exon or one gene at a time. And now we're up to this massive parallel, massively parallel sequencing where we can examine the entire genome all at once. In cytogenetics, it's a bit the reverse. So we started off looking at this bird's eye view of the packaging. And what we can do now is really zoom in. So from this resolution of 5 million base pairs down to a resolution on average of about 200,000 base pairs and look at um, aberrations and polymorphisms in our packaging. So these things don't occur just at the genetic level, they occur at the packaging level. 
we find people are missing bits of chromosomal information, people have extra chromosomal um, information. And this may or may not lead to disease. This genomic technology can be used um, across the lifespan. So tonight, um, we'll be looking at the left of this uh, timeline here and how, looking at how we can apply this uh, genomic technology to things like carrier screening to enable couples to have better options for uh, pregnancies. Um, for us, we can look at the screening of embryos. We can look at pregnant, established pregnancies. This is starting to uh, encroach on the world of newborn screening. And then we can look at how we diagnose children with rare diseases. In subsequent webinars, we'll look at um, other topics such as um, adult onset diseases. We'll look at direct-to-consumer marketing, pharmacogenomics, um, and the big uh, ticket item is cancer uh, genomics. One thing um, that um, is used, uh, not commonly, but is certainly becoming um, possible is the molecular autopsy. And so this is a way in which um, um, the genome is examined as a part of the regular autopsy, which we think of as an anatomical thing, um, examination of the, of the body. Um, but a molecular autopsy can look at the genes. And there are many causes of sudden death that are genetic in origin. Um, including things like sudden infant death syndrome, but a number of inherited cardiac diseases, um, uh, seizure disorders uh, can lead to unexplained, uh, uh, sudden unexplained death. And a molecular autopsy um, is pr proving to be a useful agent in the uh, pathologist's toolkit. So what are the implications of us being able to look at the entire genome? Well, while wide-scale genetic testing has become routinely available, it's no longer the remit of a specialist ordering a test. It is now something that people can potentially get online and order themselves. It's certainly something um, that a general practitioner um, is capable of ordering. So because of that, more people are having genetic testing. The implication of that is that we're finding things we're not necessarily looking for. And so people like myself are not out of a job because we uncover this information or well, this information gets uncovered and it needs interpretation. It needs to be related back to, to the patient. We as healthcare professionals need to be on the front foot in this brave new world. It doesn't mean that we have to know how to interpret a genetic test result doesn't necessarily mean that we'll be ordering test results, but we need to be aware of what our patients are wanting and what they're expecting and how to deal uh, with their requests. The other thing is because of this direct to consumer market that's out there, we need some ability to be able to judge what's a quality test. And believe me, not all those tests out there are quality tests. And I'll talk more about this next, uh, next month. Um, and what results are medically actionable. And so if a patient org organizes their own test and gets a result that tells them that they're predisposed to something, that can cause some distress when it actually be, may not necessarily be a um, major cause for distress. And so as a generalist, you guys have a bit of a role in being able to separate the wheat from the chaff and we're having difficulties in doing so, know how to refer on appropriately. What are the applications of this new technology? Well, the big one, of course, is diagnosis and treatment. So rare diseases, which were, I guess, well, the other word for rare diseases is orphan diseases, conditions that we're pretty sure were genetic, didn't know what the genetic cause was, didn't know um, what potentially what other health um, complications could be associated with them are now becoming something that we are able to tell patients of, about. We're able to diagnose them because we're able to look at the genes. 
um, and we're able to make predictions of you know, what that gene does and what other health conditions um, affected individual need to look, needs to look out for. We're also able to be in a better position to give recurrence risk advice. Genomics in the cancer world um, is going gangbusters. So a lot of what we'll talk about tonight is what we call germline or inherited um, uh, genomic variants. But in cancer, um, those genomic variants are acquired or um, somatic. And those genetic signatures of cancers predict things like prognosis. They can predict things like therapy. And genomics is allowing us to monitor cancers and personalize um, therapies to individuals and their particular cancers. Talking about precision medicine, pharmacogenomics um, is another big field, which has been around actually for quite a number of decades. Um, so for instance, um, drugs such as methotrexate and warfarin um, certainly um, their met met metabolic pathways are well known and uh, proteins in that pathway can have polymorphisms, which means, means people metabolize drugs too well or not well enough and thus doses is, uh, need to be adjusted. And I'm sure all of you have fond memories of being a resident medical officer in the hospital, having to go around do, and do INRs for warfarin monitoring um, um, in your youth. Um, I was promised probably about 20 years ago that that would be replaced by an end of the bed gene sequencer. So we could just tell how likely uh, someone's going to um, um, over metabolize their warfarin or if they're a slow metabolizer and we could uh, predict the dose from that. But unfortunately that's not come to come to pass. Uh, but with this brave, brave new world of genomics, um, pharmacogenomics is going to be um, a big ticket item. Screening, um, as you will hear later, um, is something that we're able to do much more effectively. So we all carry hidden genetic errors. And one of the ways children can have um, disease whilst parents are happy, uh, are happy and healthy, um, is that we unknowingly pass on these hidden errors along with our partner uh, to our children. And so genomic evaluation allows to uncover these things that we're otherwise blind to. Once we found them, other family members um, who are likely to carry the same variants can be tested and they can uh, undergo um, reproductive counselling. So it's enabling a whole heap of people um, um, a promise of a better new world in genetic health. But is genomic testing the promised panacea? Um, well, there are many advantages, don't get me wrong. The diagnostic odyssey is a uh, term um, which people uh, frequently use to explain the journey, to describe the journey that families go on, um, on average five years at a time, looking for a um, diagnosis. And that's been cut right back. A person with a um, genetic disorder may have many tests um, whilst that genetic disorder is being uncovered. And it's not just genetic tests. We need to phenotype a person to understand what the disease is doing to them. And that can involve things like um, um, EEGs and MRIs and muscle biopsies and liver biopsies uh, to get as much data as we can to look for clues as to what the underlying condition might be. All that can be completely circumvented um, in the genomic era. Um, and we go straight to the genetic cause rather than spending a lot of money on these ancillary investigations to try and work out which gene to test. Looking at all the genes um, has enabled us, as I said, to uh, find carriers and facilitate reproductive choices for couples. We can change management, especially in the cancer sphere, but also um, many other drugs, um, which, you know, uh, are all under the influence of our metabolism um, can
can be um, uh, which under under the influence of, of our metabolism can be dose specific to a patient depending on how they metabolize. Um, finding this information is not just of a benefit to the individual themselves, uh, but allows predictive testing for other family members. And the last point is, I guess, one that's called personal or family utility, which is one I um, used to underestimate. And people with the disease, even if it's something that you can't test, uh, can't treat rather, because it's in your genes, even if, if it's something that um, doesn't really um, alter their lifespan, people just like to know. People like to have an answer. And so that satisfaction of actually knowing why a person has a disease or giving a name to it, it's immensely powerful. But genomics is not without negatives. So financial burning is something um, that has uh, becoming less of an issue, but many tests are still not covered by our public health funding models or the public health funding models um, pick and choose, I guess, what uh, they, will, uh, they will test. And that's not, with, um, that's not unreasonable given that we don't have an unlimited pot of money. Um, but in terms of equity, sometimes patients are left out of pocket and sometimes left out of pocket a great deal. Testing may not provide a specific genetic answer. So people undertake this testing thinking it will be the be all, be all and end all. Um, and it might come back as a normal test result. Can't find anything. Well, the other thing is it may not provide accurate information about the risk. There may be uncertainty as to what a variant might mean, and people are still left scratching their heads. Depending on how you look at the genetic information, you can re reveal unexpected information. And that can be what we call secondary findings, uh, seeing that people are predisposed to diseases that we weren't necessarily thinking about, um, that they could be carriers for disease, um, depending on types of tests you do. Um, some of our tests ref, um, can uncover unexpected non-paternity. Non so all these things need to be considered in advance and certainly um, are discussed with patients when they're having a test, uh, before having a test and they're consented to having a test. There is a, an effect on um, insurance. Um, the, uh, it's not health insurance, that's in Australia. Health insurance um, is unbiased and, uh, and uh, this will not uh, influence your capacity to have health insurance. Um, but certainly things that protect your money, so income protection insurance and life insurance. Um, there was uh, or is this concept of genetic discrimination where insurance companies do ask you, and if you've been applied for insurance recently, you will have seen this. Have you ever had a genetic test result? and will decline to insure you or up your premiums depending on what the answer to that is and what the result was. Um, at the moment, there is a, a moratorium in that at, um, in Australia um, until I think it's about 2024. Um, and so the insurance industry realizes that it is a bit discriminatory and a bit of a problem. And so they've um, agreed to stop that practice and look at how it affects, I guess, their bottom line at the end of the day. And having a um, genetic test result finally can have negative um, um, implications for your relationships with other family members. So there's this concept of genetic guilt and people do get guilty of you know, passing on gene, uh, genetic disorders to their, to their offspring. Um, it's funny how the brain works. Some people get angry if they find their sister has a genetic disorder, even though it's, the, um, it's not the sister's fault she has a genetic disorder and that they in turn at risk of the same um, um, condition. One of the big uh, issues that we um, are slowly getting our heads around um, in terms of the um, drawbacks of genetic testing is this concept of results of uncertain significance. So it's all very well and good that we can sequence the whole genome, but not everything we find um, is necessarily interpretable. And so there's a common um, grading system that's used when reporting genetic test results. 
So a normal result, exactly that, nothing abnormal found. A pathogenic result um, means exactly that, that this variant that's found is causing disease. And then you'll see in the middle, there's varying degrees of uncertainty. So there are likely benign variants. So that's to say, based on all the evidence, we believe this variant um, is not causing disease and you need to keep looking, or likely pathogenic. Based on the evidence, this is probably causing the disease. And in between those, you have a variant of uncertain significance, where it's basically shrugging your shoulders and saying, I actually don't know what this means, which in itself can be a bit distressing for people um, because they don't have an answer. And now they've got this uh, uncertain variant that we don't know what it means. When trying to work out whether a variant is pathogenic or not, um, a variety of sources of information are used. Um, and this um, is something that, um, depending on the test undertaken and in which lab it's taken, uh, undergo, uh, the, the result undergoes quite a bit of rigor and databases are interrogated to try and ascribe a level of pathogenicity to a, to a variant. So we often start at looking at the family that's in front of us. So if we've got more than one person in the, um, uh, in the, in the family who's got the disease, then does that uh, pathogenic variant run with everyone in the family who's got the disease? Alternatively, if it looks like it's something that's recessively inherited, what we'd be looking for is um, two pathogenic variants in the one gene in the affected person and each of the parents to be carriers um, or silent carriers of, that, of those variants. Has it been reported in, um, in relation to the disease of interest before? And certainly there are um, big repositories now um, which are freely available online in which people um, contribute data from around the world saying I've got this condition with disease X and we found um, mutation Y or variant Y in this gene and we think it's the cause. And that doesn't say, doesn't say it is the cause. Um, it could be that it's a, 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 a variant that doesn't actually have an effect on the gene or the, or the encoded protein, but is an extra level of evidence if more people, um, um, if a number of people have reported the same thing. What we really want to do is start looking at big studies. So functional effects of a mutation. So these are uh, um, studies that are undertaken um, in um, research laboratories, which really characterize the mutation and how it affects the DNA. Does it stop that DNA from doing its job? Does it um, make the DNA um, encode a, a, pr a protein um, which is predicted to act differently to what we want it to. Um, and these uh, can be uh, um, ascertained through quite um, elegant experiments using um, bioinformatics, computational modeling, and the good old um, animal models and mouse models. The other big thing we've got at our disposal are population databases. So one of the big projects, for example, in the UK was to um, uh, sequence a whole heap of normal people in the population and see what the average or the normal um, genome looked like. And from that, you get an idea of what's a normal variant and what's, or a polymorphism, and what's a pathogenic variant. And depending on which um, definition you'd like to use, um, essentially anything under 1% um, that's not in the normal population um, or is absent from the population uh, can be considered um, suspicious, you might say. Then we look at other pieces of clues such as evolutionary conservation, so this is um, looking at uh, lower order species and see how well the gene is conserved through uh, the evolutionary chain. And if something is well conserved, if uh, there are no, no mutations in the normal gene through a number of species, 
then we can predict that a disruption to that gene um, is likely to be deleterious. And so these are all sources of information that are used to try and ascribe some sort of level of pathogenicity to a variant. Now, I don't want this all to be about, um, um, I guess, basic science. I don't want to be boring you in your evening talking about meiosis and mitosis and segregation. What I want to do is to work with Queensland Genomics to empower you to help you, to help your patients by using genomics. Now, this three-part webinar series um, is the uh, mode by which we're going to be doing that. But in order to know what issues you guys are having, uh, to know what problems you've encountered, um, to know what clinical um, issues uh, that pop up in your practice, then I encourage all of you to um, submit questions through Slido. Um, you can pop them in now if you like as, as we go through. Um, and I'll keep an eye on the, the uh, questions here to, uh, to my left um, and answer them as we go along. Alternatively, we can wait to the end and go through questions. But the other thing is that because this is a series, um, you're welcome to um, submit questions through that same URL uh, link um, and questions uh, will be followed up. Um, and we can regret any, any recurring themes we can um, address in future uh, webinars as well. Um, so please don't um, be a passive listener. I think especially um, with this webinar um, format, I don't know about you guys, but I find it's you know, quite convenient. I can attend a CPD session sitting at home in my lounge room, um, but there is always the, the um, um, chance that I'll zone out and start checking emails instead. So please do be an active listener and, um, and ask questions on Slido. And, and we, that helps me keep this talk um, um, you know, as pertinent to you and your needs. Um, and just a reminder, there's the link and you'll have got a copy of that link in, a, in the confirmation email for this webinar. So now on to the meat of our talk prenatal and paediatric genomics. And we'll start at the beginning, preconception genetic testing. So the idea behind preconception genetic testing is jumping in before people have kids. And basically it's designed to detect recessive carriers or carriers of recessive conditions. So as you know, with a dominant condition, then an affected individual is likely to be manifesting and they already know they've got a genetic condition. But recessive conditions, and it's estimated we all carry five or six of these recessive um, deleterious variants are out there um, in our genome. And the reason they're rare is because unless you're related to your partner, it's very unlikely they're gonna be carrying the same five or six variants. But if you just happen to meet up with someone with the same variants, and if you just happen to pass on those same variants to your offspring, then they don't inherit any normal copies of that disorder, of that gene, and they develop the disorder. And that's, as you well know, is called autosomal recessive conditions. Um, and autosomal recessive inheritance is so-called because in the carrier status, that gene error or that mutation received behind the normal copy. But let's not forget X-linked recessive conditions as well. Uh, so again, uh, as the name implies, these are, are recessive conditions, um, but they, uh, the gene of interest or the mutation of interest is on the X chromosome. Um, and they are hidden in females and are passed down through the female lineage in a hidden form because females have two X chromosomes. Um, and so they're protected by their second normal copy. But should a female pass on that error to their to their son, he doesn't inherit an X chromosome in his dad, he, carries a, he inherits a Y chromosome. And so that child will manifest the disease. And so a number of X-linked recessive um, conditions can also be tested, uh, can be tested for through screening. So how do we start this whole preconception screening? 
Well, your very own manual says that all women or couples planning a pregnancy or already pregnant, she has a comprehensive family history recorded. And so a family history is actually the first tool we have um, in screening. And it's a, a, it's a very useful, uh, simple but useful tool. Um, it's certainly not infallible, um, but it's something that I encourage you to engage with, with all your um, couples who, are, who come to talk about um, pregnancy who will present early in a pregnancy. Anyone who's found to have um, a heritable condition in the family or who um, are known to be carriers of a condition then should be um, made aware that carrier testing is available um, and are highly recommended that they refer to a specialist service. Now it's an interesting comment here that carrier screening for common recessive conditions and by that, they mean cystic fibrosis, um, but the other two that are considered common, uh, spinal muscular atrophy and fragile X, um, should, uh, should carry testing for these conditions should be offered to all couples. So not, those, not just those at high risk, um, but all those at population risk. And I don't think that's something that we um, uh, do or do well. Um, and probably the main reason is because these tests aren't um, Medicare rebatable. And so it hasn't really been ingrained in our um, routine practice. So I do, I do laugh a bit when it says that all couples planning a pregnancy should have a comprehensive family tree taken. And if you look at what a comprehensive family tree is, um, it's big. Now in this age of electronic medical records, I'd be flat out drawing that. Um, I'd have to probably draw it on a piece of paper and then scan it. Um, although in a clinical genetics setting, we have uh, specialized software that helps us. But even that, there's no way you're gonna be able to do that in a 15 minute consultation and everything else you have to do in that same consultation. So whilst I'd be impressed if you could, if you could um, come to me with a family tree um, um, that, that um, detailed, what you should be concentrating on is what's the bare minimum. And the bare minimum is basically a three generational tree. So this um, is something that only really comes with practice. So the first time you take a family uh, history, um, it can be a bit cumbersome. Um, and like anything in, in life or anything in medicine, you learn from your mistakes. And so probably the biggest um, error people make is drawing a couple, then drawing out all their children, only to find halfway through that half the children belong to a different father. And so then you have to scrub all that and start again. And so once you've done that mistake, made that mistake a couple of times, um, you'll start to, you'll come up with some very uh, quick and pithy questions to, to avoid it, such as how many kids do you have? Do they all have the same parents? And then start writing it down. So ask specifically about half sieve ships because um, they um, um, will be sure to, to mess up your, your lovely diagram. Ask specifically about known genetic diseases. Obviously, that's what we're interested in. Um, ask about premature death. Um, is there a, so young death um, in the family, um, that's, especially if it's unexplained. And the other big thing um, to ask about is intellectual impairment. And the reason for that is intellectual impairment um, is a, a feature of many, many, many con um, genetic conditions. And so if there is a um, history of that in the family, it could be something that's worth um, looking into a little more, um, especially if it's a male connected to your, let's say woman in front of you through a number of females, um, you'd need to be concerned about an X-linked intellectual um, um, disability. Uh, the other question um, it's always worth remembering to ask is about consanguinity. Um, in this part of the world, in, in Queensland, that often gets a, f a few giggles when you ask, um, are you or your partner related at all? Um, but it is an important uh, question to ask because consanguinity, as I said before, um, you are likely to share the same genetic errors um, as those you're related to. 
And so consanguinity does increase the chances of um, recessive diseases in future, gen in, in future generations. Following up on the clues though, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy task and it's not something I'd be expecting you to do in general practice. But if um, somebody you know, has some more details about Uncle Fred who died or um, um, my sister's child who um, has an intellectual disability, they might be able to come back to you with some medical reports, giving you an idea of uh, whether or not what you're dealing with is genetic or not. But if it's something that um, um, for whatever reason is not uh, something you can follow up on well, then that's what your friendly genetic counselling service is for. And a genetic counsellor is very adept um, at chasing up leads and trying to find what, um, what clues there are looking um, for the possibility of a genetic condition in a family. Preconception um, genetic testing um, is the next step up really after a family tree. Um, and this, again, has been around for, for you know, quite some decades, especially Jewish screening programs. Um, so these are uh, bigger in Sydney and Melbourne where there are large um, genetic, uh, sorry, Jewish uh, populations. Um, but they look for um, carriers of conditions where there's known to be a, um, um, a founder effect. So. Uh, that's to say that these um, individuals um, have a, I guess, a genetic commonality. And back in their uh, founding, their founding fathers and mothers, um, uh, certain hidden genetic errors were introduced. Um, with the Gen Jewish screening programs, they uh, are mainly for inborn errors of metabolism. The big one that you probably heard of is Tay-Sachs disease. Um, but there are particular mutations associated with cystic fibrosis, um, which are looked for. And um, there are a whole heap of other very rare conditions, um, but are more common in Jewish communities uh, that are looked at at a single gene level in these programs. On the right there, I show those three common, and I, I use the word common loosely, uh, but those three common um, um, autosomal recessive conditions so spinal muscular atrophy, for instance, um, uh, we'll get onto a bit more, um, but it's a, a common, um, a very devastating disease really, um, for which by the way, there are um, uh, treatment is becoming available, um, but it's, it is recommended that couples considering a, um, a pregnancy are tested for these three conditions. It's not a great deal of money. You look probably your average couple's going to be out of pocket two hundred and fifty dollars, and that's per person. Um, to save money, um, what people do is um, um, they they tier their screening so they just test um, usually the woman first, and then um, if she screens negative, then uh, there's no need to test the male. If she screens positive, then obviously you test the male. At which point. Um, you're going to be five hundred dollars out of pocket, but to be honest, if you're um, if you find that someone's a carrier for a condition, then there's you know a good reason to refer them to your local public genetics service, where the male um, test may or may not be covered, um, depending on um, the service, um, their budget, and, and their um, um, I guess financial uh, constraints and. Uh, The big thing that's really come up in um, genomics is this massive parallel, massively parallel sequencing, also known as next generation sequencing. So what is this next generation sequencing? Well, this is what enables us to not just look for three um, diseases in carrier screening, but to look for hundreds of diseases in carrier screening. And previously, when we were looking at a gene, basically we'd have probes that would flank the gene um, and we'd read through the gene um, and then find, uh, you know, work out there's a mutation there or not. And these um, flanking probes 
um, wouldn't just be flanking the gene, but it'd be on a, a, a lesser scale, they'd be flanking the exons within the genes. So if you've got 20,000 genes and if they've got on average 10 exons each, then that's a lot of uh, flanking probes and a lot of tests you need to be need to be done to look at all your genes. Massive, massively parallel sequencing um, negates that. What it does is basically it's a blood test from which you can extract the DNA. That DNA is basically chopped up into lots of little pieces and then it's dragged down or um, mapped against a reference sequence. And against that reference sequence, which is meant to be you know, what a normal um, genome is, um, we are able to find anything that stands out as um, abnormal. So we can technically look at the whole genome and not just the genes, but all the bits of DNA in between. This is actually available commercially at the moment. There are a couple of companies um, that operate through Australia that offer this. Um, and I was having a look at their websites um, and I can't say I particularly agree with all the conditions they, they screen for. I don't think all of them um, are conditions that you um, should be screening for, uh, but that's a debate for another day. Uh, but on average, they screen for between 250 and 750 conditions. And it's not outrageously expensive, um, to be honest. It's um, for massively parallel sequencing um, screening, um, it's between $500 and $750 per person. Um, so this is a screening which is available to your patients now. Um, and should they be in a position to pay for it themselves, um, it's something that they can have. Um, it's something that they could potentially, um, depending on the company they go through, order themselves online and they come into your office waving their report already. At this juncture, I'd like to mention Mackenzie's mission. So we mentioned um, Queensland Genomics. Um, it's, the, its existence is thanks to $25 million from the um, uh, state government. The federal government um, has donated um, tens and tens of millions of dollars into genomic projects over the last five years or so. Um, and one of these projects is Mackenzie's mission. Um, and that's a picture there of actually of, of Mackenzie Casella, um, who was a young girl whose uh, parents were very proactive in the, their pregnancy. Um, they went to their GP, they had um, asked, what, what do I need to be concerned about? Are there any tests available? Um, 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 that I should have been concerned about having a child with a genetic condition or other conditions for that matter. Um, and unfortunately in this circumstance, the, the GP didn't realize that screening for this condition, spinal muscular atrophy um, was available. Um, and Mackenzie was born and diagnosed with uh, spinal muscular atrophy and, and sadly died. Um, the parents were quite upset, um, but not vindictive in any way. Uh, but they took their plight to the Commonwealth government and said, look, this isn't good enough. There was testing available for us to um, um, find out if we were carriers of SMA. We could have avoided having a child with SMA and all the heartache that goes, goes with that. Um, but this isn't in our healthcare system. It isn't mainstreamed. Our GP didn't even know about it. Um, what are you going to do about it? And around the same time, or the, there were a couple of um, geneticists who um, were also getting passionate about, about one of them, of course, being Mackenzie's doctor, um, and went and lobbied the government um, saying, look, actually, this isn't a bad idea. We should be empowering couples um, to have um, preconception screening. And so the, they, the Commonwealth government um, has provided a $20 million grant uh, for this very large research project. And what's happening is 10,000 couples are being offered next generation preconception screening for about 750 conditions. Um, and these are being um, ascertained through general practices um, and maternity settings. Um, it's not occurring in Queensland yet. I think next year, um, 
Queensland patients will be able to be enrolled in this project. And I'm not actually sure how you as a general practitioner can get your name on the list of um, being able to offer this to your patients. Um, but it's something obviously that they um, are not offering to everybody because um, although $20 million is a lot of money, it doesn't actually go a long way. Um, especially when you look at the uh, purposes of the study, it's not just to look to see if they can find carrier couples. The expectation is yes, of course we, we can, but the um, also need to find out is finding this information useful. Uh, do people actually act on this information? Do they change their um, reproductive options? Um, and is it acceptable technology? Is it something the community embraces or is it something they shun, it shuns? Um, and so these questions are also being uh, looked at. So there are a number of arms to this um, study, but the um, long-term goal of this project is to embed routine carrier screening into routine um, prenatal health care. So if a couple finds they are a carrier, what are their options? Well, of course, the first is to do nothing, um, at which point if a couple says, well, we're not really wanting to change anything we do, you can argue, well, why well, had the screening in the first place? Um, um, and certainly the health economists um, would very much argue that. Another argument people um, would make is that people just like to know and be prepared. And I've heard that from a lot of patients um, who say, look, you know, I, I don't actually want to uh, um, interfere in the natural process of conception um, and gestation in any way, but I just want to be prepared. The second option available is gamete donation. Um, so obviously if it's an X-linked condition, then you'd want to be looking for a donor egg. If it's an X, if it's a autosomal recessive condition, then it could be sperm or egg. Um, the um, point there, of course, is to not to want to state the obvious, is just be careful who your donor is. You want, don't want to make sure that they're a carrier. You want to make sure they're not a carrier of the same condition. Um, so if it's a brother or sister, then obviously you'd want to test them first to ensure that they're not carriers. The next option, which is uh, probably the most common option that's undertaken, is having an invasive procedure. So this is um, testing an established pregnancy. So that's through amniocentesis, uh, looking at the um, amniotic fluid or chorionic fluid sampling, which is testing the placenta, which is made up of the same genes and chromosomes as the baby, and um, sending that off to the lab for testing. And the idea there is that should a pregnancy be um, affected with a serious genetic condition, then that couple has the option of terminating the pregnancy. Now, obviously, that's not um, something people um, undertake lightly. Um, the technology which does help circumvent having to undergo a termination of pregnancy is pre-implantation genetic testing. So this is undertaken in the setting of in vitro fertilization. So a pregnancy is established in the laboratory through IVF um, at the usually around the uh, four to six cell stage. Um, genetic material is sampled and that is tested um, um, for the disease of interest. Um, and believe it or not, you can also look at the chromosomal packaging of that um, embryo at that stage to make sure that there's no um, aneuploidy such as Down syndrome. And then obviously you'd only implant um, um, embryos back into the womb um, that are free from known genetic conditions. Now, this is of course using small amounts of uh, uh, DNA. Um, and so um, people who offer PGT um, would always recommend that once the pregnancy has been established, that you do have a follow-up invasive procedure just to make sure um, that it wasn't a false negative result. But these are options for couples and that's why we can undertake um, um, preconception um, screening. But what if your um, pregnancy is already established? Um, what screening is available prenatally? Um, well, I should point out that that preconception screening is still available um, in the early stages of pregnancy. So if you do it quickly then and find out couples are, are carriers of recessive conditions, um, um, should everything be undertaken quickly, um, then you can have genetic test results to test an established pregnancy. Um, but as you all know, routine prenatal screening 
um, has been well established in routine antenatal care since at least the 1970s. So um, what's the advantage of prenatal screening over um, preconception screening? Well, preconception screening, we're only talking about those recessive conditions, um, so and some will excellent recessive conditions that have been carried around the population. Actually, um, a large portion, if not most of genetic diseases occurs de novo. So that's not something that um, either the father or the mother are necessarily carrying, but a alteration occurs in either the packaging of the genes or the genes themselves um, as they're being formed and passed on to the child. Um, and so that person is the first one um, in, the, in the family to be affected with a genetic con condition. And so prenatal screening aims to detect a proportion of these uh, de novo conditions. Um, and these are primarily chromosomal disorders. And that's what the main uh, mainstay of um, um, prenatal screening is, looking for chromosomal aneuploidy. And so um, those of you who look after uh, pregnant women will know this very well, um, that a number of vari variables are associated with aneuploidy and, and quite strongly. So the first, of course, is maternal age. So the higher um, the mother's age, the more likely um, she is of having a child with abnormal chromosomes, um, but also a number of hormones. So the PAPA and beta HCG. Then um, on ultrasound, the um, nuchal translucency, which is essentially the fluid at the back of the baby's neck there that you can see in the diagram, uh, thickened nuchal translucency is associated with um, chromosomal disorders, in particular Down syndrome. Um, as, a, as is a short nasal bone length. Um, now, essentially, with combined first trimester screening, that maternal age, the level of those um, um, maternal hormones, or the placental hormones, really, um, and those ultrasound findings, are basically, um, the, the values are shoved into a computer and a regression analysis is undertaken, um, and it comes up with a unifying risk figure. Um, and um, for reasons I'm not entirely sure of actually, one in 300 is considered to be the cutoff for an increased risk. So anybody who receives uh, increased risk of um, greater than one in 300 um, is offered uh, follow-up um, invasive testing to definitively look at the pregnancy's um, uh, chromosomes. I will just note at this point that the ultrasound um, whilst those variables there are part of the formal um, first, first trimester screen, um, it's also important for other reasons. Obviously, you want to confirm the pregnancy. You want to make sure it's not in a fallopian tube. You want to see what's implanted. Um, it helps confirm the dates, and you want to make sure that there are no extra uh, people on board. Um, or well, some people are happy to have extra people on board, uh, but they just you know, make sure there's no, no um, nasty surprises down the track of undiagnosed twin triplet pregnancies. Second trimester screening does exist. It's less sensitive than first trimester screening. It's not really undertaken a lot in this part of the world. It's very big in the USA, uh, but not really big in Australia. Probably if a, if a um, woman misses her first trimester screening, she didn't realize she was pregnant or whatever, um, it, it can be offered in that uh, setting. Um, it's essentially just a, um, a quad test. So that's looking at uh, four um, hormones from the mother's blood. And again, it's uh, looking uh, for the common aneuploidies, trisomy 21, 18, and 13, um, but it's not as sensitive um, or specific as first trimester screening, um, but does have the added advantage of looking for neural tube defects. Um, but having said that, if there is a neural tube defect, such as spina bifida, you should hopefully pick that up on your uh, first trimester um, ultrasound. Um, um, but if you don't, then all pregnant women should be having a second trimester morphology scan. And that's because um, structural organogenesis is complete by that stage. So all your organs have, you know, all the, the layout of all your organs is complete um, whilst the cells are still being um, laid down and they're increasing complexity. Um, their main structure is there. And so this is to screen for major structural uh, malformations. And you also want to know, have some idea where the placenta is um, so that can be kept um, um, in an eye as the pregnancy progresses. Of course, the big thing that's changed in prenatal um, test uh, screening is this uh, non-invasive 
um, um, prenatal testing. Or you might see the term uh, non-invasive prenatal screening, NIPS, which is technically more correct, um, but the uh, term NIPT came around first, got into the literature, and so it's more commonly used. So even though it's called a test, um, it is technically a screen, and you must remember that um, it is a screen and not a definitive test. And how does this work? Well, up to 20%, so about 10%, but up to 20% of free DNA, so this is non-encapsulated DNA that's floating around in the maternal circulation, comes from the placenta. And so the placenta is a, an active organ undergoing a lot of growth and apoptosis. And as that apoptosis occurs, cells die, DNA is released, um, and that just floats um, in the maternal circulation uh, for about half an hour or so. Um, and then um, our own inherited cells, of course, undergo apoptosis and we have our own native um, um, non uh, cell-free DNA. And so how non-invasive um, prenatal testing works is that it's a simple maternal blood test and the cell-free DNA is isolated. Um, through those next generation sequencing technologies, you can work out which DNA comes from mum, which comes from bub. Um, and then working out what comes from baby, you can look at the proportion of fetal DNA and make sure there's the correct amount. So if there's too much DNA from chromosome 21, 18 or 13, then that's indicative of a, of a trisomy. Um, and it's also good at looking for sex chromosome aneuploidies. Uh, so um, Kleinfelter syndrome and Turner syndrome, for instance. These um, are highly, it's highly accurate. It's amazing. It's um, for Down syndrome, it's approaching 100% sensitivity and specificity. Um, uh, but it's not 100% and, I, and I'll uh, stress that it's not 100%. So it is a testing. It is a, a screening uh, test, not a diagnostic test. Now, um, if you have got a provider for this, this test and you've looked at their glossy brochures, they will advertise that they look for, they'll, they'll undertake extended screening. And so they'll look at the other chromosomes. So there are um, um, all um, manners of permutations between um, um, you know, what additional chromosome um, information, missing chromosome in, um, information, uh, microaneuploidies, and um, a number of companies have um, um, incorporated um, this into their NIPT. Now, the positive predictive value for these uh, tests is low. Uh, it's not to say it's not um, that the test itself isn't valuable or worthwhile. Um, but if you get a positive result, the chance that that pregnancy is actually affected, you know, it tends to be low. So we're talking the order of 5%. So outside your common aneuploidies, NIPT for your other uh, chromosome aneuploidies isn't that great. Um, the main disadvantage of that, of course, is that um, someone um, who screens positive goes on to have an invasive test, which is obviously uncomfortable and theoretically puts the pregnancy at risk, um, is more likely than not to have a normal pregnancy. So it's not a perfect screening test for other aneuploidies. Um, so just like combined first trimester screening, NIPT should be considered a screening test and should always be a positive result, should always be followed up with um, um, chorionic villa sampling, or actually preferably amniocentesis. And the reason we say amniocentesis is that's more reflective of the chromosomes of the baby um, rather than the placenta. Okay, so once um, we've had all that screening, we've got a healthy baby born. And poor old baby is then subjected to newborn screening. So what's the role of newborn screening? Well, obviously, we, until preconception screening is reliably um, entrenched in routine care. And I say reliably, um, it's, it's not that simple. Um, so if a couple has preconception screening um, and all turns out to be okay, the next time say that woman or even that man has another child, it's not necessarily with the same person. Um, and so just because a person screened um, negative once as a couple doesn't mean they're going to be have a negative screen as a couple with their next partner. So newborn screening is going to be around for quite a while. It of course um, is um, the, the, the basis of our traditional heel prick or Guthrie test um, which was developed for phenylketonuria, PKU, um, and over the years a number of conditions have been added to, to the Guthrie. Um, it's taken at 48 hours of age and the reason for that is that by 48 hours of age, 
the baby's metabolism is more reflective of its own metabolism um, and um, of, a, of, a, of a baby feeding and, and functioning ex utero than it is of a maternal metabolism. And that's important because the vast majority of conditions screened for on the gut three are metabolic. And so you want to have um, the, the baby's metabolism being screened, not the mother's. The main conditions that are screened for um, are cystic fibrosis, a whole swag of metabolic conditions, including amino acidopathies and fatty acidation disorders. Um, and the other one, which is not genetic, the only one that's not genetic actually, is congenital hypothyroidism. And this is uh, not a genetic test, um, it's a biochemical test. And so this is where tandem mass spectrometry has really um, come to the fore um, and has been able to uh, screen um, um, multiple samples um, for multiple um, analytes simultaneously. And so has um, really given us a very um, effective screening program. The other newer part to newborn screening is of course the hearing screen. So all babies now should have their hearing assessed. So there are a couple of different audiological techniques used to screen the newborn. Um, and essentially if um, a baby fails the, the um, hearing screen, then um, they're referred on to a specialist service or an ENT surgeon for further evaluation and audio, audiology. I will point out that a number of um, causes of congenital deafness are actually genetic in origin. Um, um, and I'll come back to that point in a moment. So in Queensland, this is very much entrenched in our public um, service. The um, screening is undertaken through both public and private services, um, Queensland wide, but they're all sent to our statewide pathology service um, here at Hurston in Brisbane and Queensland Health. Um, and they have a um, very, as you would imagine, slick um, um, uh, alarm service, which goes back to the uh, child's nominated uh, uh, pediatrician and or obstetrician and positive screens are then usually followed up through the pediatrician or neonatologist that was involved, or at least on call, um, the day the baby was born. Um, and that's a system that works very well. Um, and any, and I'm not aware of anyone who's, um, any failed screen results um, because of a, a slip up in a communication of a positive result, um, any, failed screen results, and they are very, very rare, um, um, is usually because of limitation in the technology. But what about the future for newborn screening? As I said, everything we screen for um, um, on the heel prick is genetic in origin. Um, everything except is genetic in origin except for congenital hypothyroidism. Um, so why don't we screen the genes rather than just the metabolites? Is that where we're heading? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Certainly people are looking at it and pe people are thinking about it. Um, maybe we don't want to know our baby's genome. Um, but just because you sequence a genome doesn't mean you have to know everything that's there. There are ways that you can look at multiple genes through these next generation sequencing technologies and just pick and choose what you look at or uh, pick and choose what you, what you sequence. And these are very uh, well established tests um, for um, you know, panel diseases. Um, so, um, those fears that you know we're you know looking at the baby and peering into its future even before it's um, learned to walk um, you know are not necessarily well founded um, but this might be the way we're going um, extended newborn screening um, through uh, genomics does exist actually um, so there are at least two private companies in Australia that offer it uh, direct to consumer um, and they're able to screen for many, many more tests than um, what's screened for on the uh, Guthrie Hill, Hill prick. Um, once you've got that data, um, there is an advantage that you can go back and look at it. So if the child develops something else um, that's unrelated to the conditions you're screening for, um, you might be able to go back and look at the, the genomic data and see um, you know, if there's a genetic disorder there. The disadvantages, um, well, the more genes you look at, the more likely you are to uncover these variants of unknown significance. So we can look at all, it's all very well and good to look at all the genes, but you know, we can sometimes be scratching our head and would screening by uh, looking at the genome cause more um, angst than, than benefit. 
And the big thing that people really worry about is potentially uncovering adult onset disease. And so you want a child to be enjoying um, um, their childhood without the, the burden and the parents for that matter, they want to be enjoying their children without being concerned of what may um, affect them in, in adulthood. So these are some of the concerns that people uh, argue against uh, newborn genetic screening. So are we ready to go there? I don't know, I think we are just yet, um, but it's something, a research question that's being examined. So paediatric genetics. Um, so this um, is a um, um, field that um, I don't have a lot to say on for the general practitioner, um, simply because it's more in the realm of general paediatricians, but the general practitioner does have a role to play. Um, how is genomics benefiting in paediatrics? Well, the main beneficiaries, of course, are, are, are children and, and families with rare diseases. So these um, are children with um, conditions that we, um, with, with unusual presentations or rare presentations, the genomic basis for their disease uh, hadn't been elucidated, um, or if it had, it um, you know, might have uh, been you know, once on the other side of the world, um, testing was not routinely available. Um, the testing, the one reported case occurred in a research setting and that research had um, um, subsequently closed down so it wasn't ac accessible. So um, that's pretty much gone now. So people were set on what they call this diagnostic odyssey um, where children um, were having test after test, and it's not just, as I said before, genetic tests, a whole heap of tests to phenotype um, a, a child and see what other concomitant um, um, issues they might be having, um, and seeing multiple specialists. And that journey from um, symptoms first showing to, to diagnosis, or, was the, the, or the diagnostic odyssey went down from five years, it's now down to less than six months. So it's benefiting paediatrics immensely. Um, one of the things our Commonwealth Government here has done this year, um, and I think this is just amazing. Um, I, I don't usually um, praise politicians, so usually I almost never praise politicians, but um, our, our current health minister has really thrown a lot of money at um, genetics um, and genomics, and he has um, got onto the, well, not just he personally, this does go through a very uh, stringent um, um, panel process and approval process, but genomes are now on the Medicare schedule. Now, GEPs are not able to order them. Um, these really are, are the remit of clinical geneticists. Um, so, but clinical geneticists are able to order uh, testing um, for children who have major structural abnormalities um, of, and um, what we call dysmorphic features. So that's uh, that's usually facial features that are suggestive of a particular syndrome or out of keeping with their family background. Um, and the other big group of people are children with intellectual disability or moderate to severe uh, developmental delay. Um, and so this being on the Medicare schedule now makes this test much more accessible um, to, to doctors to be able to order. So previously, while well, they thought I might like to be able to order it, but I can't because the hospital budget won't let me or my my patient's private and they can't afford it. Um, now the Commonwealth Government is uh, allowing um, uh, that test to occur and they will pick up the tab. Paediatricians can order it, um, but they need to do so in consultation with the clinical geneticist. And that's the exact wording um, of, of the um, NBS and what that actually means, consultation with the clinical geneticist. We're all a bit uncertain, uh, but certainly, um, uh, paediatricians and clinical geneticists are currently working closely together to try and define that um, post hoc. How might um, you in, in general practice encounter a possible uh, paediatric genetic condition? Well, the main um, presentation is probably going to be developmental delay. Um, rarely you might have a child that's got some sort of strange disease of a, of a isolated organ. Um, but it's unlikely that you're going to start um, ordering genetic tests in those uh, situations. But the other th thing that I've certainly seen, and I've had a number of GPs uh, send my way over the years, is where there's a, a genetic condition popped up in the family, either in a parent or even a more distant relative, 
and the child's dragged along by their hair, um, and the parent requesting that the child's tested. So I'll just a few quick words on developmental delay, um, and I won't um, tell you guys how to do your job because this is bread and butter for you. Um, but um, you know, developmental delay really is a part of the normal spectrum, isn't it? Um, so some people uh, develop at a more advanced uh, rate than others, and other, um, and so a, a lot of um, what you do in general practice um, in those first years of life with children is monitoring their development um, and I guess trying to work out when is it uh, normal, develop, um, normal developmental delay or when is it um, something that's a bit more sinister. Um, and things that might make you think that it's a bit more sinister um, is if um, the development stagnates, so it's not going forward at all. Um, even worse, if it, if it regresses, developmental regression is a terrible thing. Um, it's associated with um, probably invariably disastrous diagnoses. Um, the reason the developmental delay is an important thing to be screening is because um, it's the first clue that an intellectual impairment might be present. And by intellectual impairment, I will, will include autism in that. Now, intellectual impairment can have many, many causes. Um, and there are many single gene disorders uh, that can cause intellectual impairment. Um, um, but uh, often it's a polygenic um, condition. So it's not just a single genetic variant. Um, there could be multiple genetic variants uh, which come together in the one person um, that's causing the impairment. And our next generation sequencing technologies show promise in that we might be able to look at different variants and see how they come together in a person. Um, to predispose to intellectual impairment. And that can be environmental, of course, as well. So we talked about uh, phenylketone neuro, phenylketone neuro before. So that um, uh, can be an example of an environmental cause of intellectual impairment if the mother has high levels of phenylalanine that it interferes with the development of her, uh, of her fetus's brain. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome, another uh, common cause, unfortunately, of intellectual impairment. Um, that's of environmental in nature. Um, so the role of the general practitioner is to continue with that great screening that you do. Um, but I think you do have an important role in commencing baseline investigations before referring to a paediatric, a paediatric assessment. Um, and I think that's advantageous to the family um, because if you know what the paediatrician is going to order and say to the family, okay, have these tests and come back and see me in a couple of months, then why not do the tests first? Um, and that sort of takes away one step of that diagnostic odyssey for that family. And so tests that you might, that you should be ordering for a child that you're concerned about the development. The first is a chromosome microarray. And I will actually go back to the poll here. You can see I've got a couple of, quite a few questions that have come through. Um, so I better leave myself enough time to come to those. Um, but going back to the live poll, who here um, has ordered, ordered a chromosome microarray. So going back, going to your poll, um, what I'd like to know is who's ordered a chromosome microarray? Yes or no? Um, the other test, well, I'll well, wait for those answers to come through. The other um, couple of tests that you should be doing for a basic um, um, screen for developmental delay are Fragile X studies. Fragile X is the most common monogenetic uh, condition that causes um, intellectual impairment. And although it's X-linked, it can affect females as well. So you um, so don't just do it if, you, if your patient's male, uh, it should be undertaken on both males and females. And then thinking, of, thinking broadly, um, undertake a little bit of biochemistry as well. So thyroid function tests, um, although we screen for hypothyroidism, um, the, hypo, um, the, the screen test actually only screens for congenital absence of the thyroid. So if it's a central problem, a pituitary problem, that will be missed. So you should still do thyroid function tests. Um, and then I would always do just do some baseline biochemistry um, and um, a full blood examination. Um, before I move on the slide, I haven't got anyone who's said they've ever ordered a chromosome microarray yet. So I don't know if that's, if no one has or no one's answered. So I'll keep going in the interest of time. So what is this chromosome microarray? 
Well, basically, it's a very high resolution chromosome analysis. Um, so previously, where a um, chromosome um, test was really looking down quite crudely um, under the microscope or down the microscope at the, at the chromosomes, what a microarray does is it doesn't physically look at it, but basically chops up the, the chromosomes into small parts, into small stretches of DNA, and then um, hybridizes that, what we call test DNA, against a um, control DNA. And so there's a couple of ways that this can be done, um, but basically this, what happens then is the amount of, of um, test DNA is measured. And so you can have too much test DNA, which would in indicate that there's something like a, a duplication or a triplication of um, genetic material, or not enough, which is a deletion. And so these are, are looking beyond the resolution um, of the naked eye down to a resolution of about 200,000 um, 200, uh, base pair level. And there are quite a number of um, syndromes and genetic conditions caused by micro deletions and, and duplications. Now this test alone has a pickup rate of about five to 15% of cases in individuals with developmental delay or intellectual impairment. So it's a pretty useful test to do. And certainly one which is on the Medicare uh, schedule and one that um, if you know, you're worried about your um, uh, child or your patient's child, um, that um, I would be encouraging you to, to order. Um, now that five to 15% actually goes up if there are other uh, features present. So if the child looks a little unusual, has to do with smorphic features or this congenital malformations, in which case they're probably already under pediatric um, care, um, then the chance of finding a, a micro chromosome aberration increases. So this is a simple test that can be done in the GP practice. Um, I've yet, as yet, I've still not had anyone say they've ordered a chromosome microarray. So we'll keep moving on. Now, unfortunately, just like with um, next generation sequencing results, um, the result may not necessarily be clear cut. Um, and we use a similar grading scheme of pathogenicity for chromosomal conditions as we do for single gene disorders. So at the two ends, it's either clearly normal or clearly abnormal. Um, and then in between, it could be likely benign, likely pathogenic, or it could be of unknown significance. Now this um, has deterred people, uh, especially when this technology first was rolled out, from doing the test, they didn't really want to get back a report saying we've done the test, we don't know what it means, um, because obviously you're not too, too, too sure how to communicate that to parents. Um, but these results, such results are becoming um, less common, I might say, um, or if they are um, coming about, then we, we know we've got more experience in how to deal with it. So I would um, argue that you are better off doing the test and having some information than no information at all. Um, the other um, piece of information that chromosome microarrays can uncover, and I just mentioned this because if you do order it, you might find this and wonder what it is, is um, um, stretches of homozygosity. So this, there are two types of microarrays. So one's called a array CGH, the other's called a SNP array. Um, and so the SNP arrays, which are probably the more common platform now, um, can uncover this uh, stretches of homozygosity. And what that's basically telling you is that the child looks to have inherited two parts of a chromosome from the one parent. Um, now that can be diagnostic if we're testing for developmental delay because uniparental disomy, where two uh, copies come from one parent, is a feature of a, of a number of conditions. And the, the textbook case, which you're probably aware of, all cases, uh, Angelman syndrome and Prader-Willi syndrome of uh, chromosome 15 Q11. Um, and so that's one of the, the powerful diagnostic um, capabilities of SNP arrays. Um, but you might get a long contiguous stretch of homo homozygosity, and these pop up every now and then. You might find that a child has got random um, stretches of homozygosity um, across the genome, you know, in the order of 7% of the, of the genome. This is completely unexpected. So if the parents were consanguinous, then, you know, you'd expect to find um, some contiguous stretches of homozygosity because you know that there's common ancestor there where... Um, the same alleles tracking down through each side of the family and will come together in the one child. But we find it uh, where there's no known um, um, 
consanguinity. Um, so that can um, be a bit of a su surprise at times. This here is an example of a report. I'm not sure if that comes across on your screen at all. Um, and this is what I would um, call quite a conservative report. Now it's pretty wordy, I'll grant you that. Um, but if you just break it down into its core um, elements, it just gives what the clinical indication was. Um, we're told what the abnormality is. So here we've got a, a small, so 973 kilobase, or that's a thousand bases, uh, a deletion at chromosome Q11. Now, the next bit of information um, is important for someone like me, where it gives me the exact genomic coordinates for that bit of chromosome um, deletion that's gone missing. And why that's important is that allows me to go and look at a number of databases to see what other people around the world have reported um, on that particular deletion, but it's not something you're likely to do in general practice. You're hoping that the lab's done that hard work for you, and indeed they have. Um, and that's where the, the gene content uh, part with the green arrow is pointing. So it tells you the, uh, the extent of the deletion and what genes are involved. Now it tells us here that this is known as acceptability for developmental delay. Um, it gives some literature there telling us um, you know, who's, who's told us that and why. So you can go to the literature and, and find out um, what's, the, um, what's the evidence behind that. Um, but what really um, amuses me, I guess, about this particular report, and I won't say which lab it comes from, is the conclusion down the bottom, which is, says, the clinical significance of this copy number change is currently uncertain. So it's called it a variant of unknown significance. Now that's not very helpful, I have to say. Um, it's also recommending that you look at the parents, um, and they frequently do that in this situation when you've got a variant of unknown significance. Um, and the reason they do that to, is to see if it comes from mum or dad. Um, and at one point in time, we used to think, well, if mum's normal and she's got it, then it's probably not going to be anything significant. Um, but as the report itself states, this is a susceptibility um, micro deletion. So it in and, of, in and of itself does not cause developmental delay. Just having it there uh, increases the chances. So this is contributing, I would argue, to the patient's clinical picture. It's not um, uh, telling us the whole story. And I would actually question um, the, the value of testing the parents because if you test a normal parent, then that doesn't give you any further information. If the parent themselves has got some intellectual issues and learning difficulties and they've got the variant, then I guess that could uh, support um, the conclusion that it is contributing to an intellectual impairment in this family. Um, but don't let that put you off from ordering a chromosome microarray. Um, and according to my Slido poll so far, still no one's ordered a, a chromosome microarray. So um, most cases, if you fi get a, find an abnormality on your microarray, then that's going to be the cause for your pathology. So it is a very useful test. Now, Rarely, um, we do uncover chromosome rearrangements um, that involve other genes, and which might have other health implications. And again, in the early days, this um, turned off a lot of people from ordering a microarray. They were just scared about what they might uncover. So for instance, if you've got a chromosome deletion which takes out a tumor suppressor gene, then you might have a child with an increased chance of cancer in adulthood. Um, if it takes out something like a sodium ion channel, and that might predispose to a cardiac dysrhythmia. And so this was information people were saying, well, these are you know, potentially adult onset conditions. I don't want to be testing a child for that. We won't order it. Um, and so it took quite a while to um, uh, convince in particular the general pediatricians that they need to be ordering microarrays rather than a G-banded carrier type. Um, um, but as people got comfortable with this test, it got um, ordered a lot more. Um, and the, the option of a G-banded carrier type was by and large taken away from people um, because, because the diagnostic ability of microarray is so much greater than a G-banded carrier type. If you ask for a chromosome test, you'll get a microarray, um, which has surprised me that still no one has said they've ordered a microarray. So I'll stop harping on about that question. Um, I do mention all this because I think it's probably worth mentioning if only in passing to the family. Look, we're doing this chromosome test to look to see if the packaging of the genes um, for your child is 
uh, intact. If it's not, it might be a um, explanation for the issues we're seeing. Um, um, occasionally these tests, they, these tests are very powerful and occasionally they find things that we're not expecting, but we'll cross that bridge if we come to it. So I don't think you need to, you, well, you can't um, prime some of every possibility, but I think it's, um, um, uh, you know, polite at, at the very least um, to get some sort of informed consent to say that, you know, we might find something. The other condition I um, recommend you test for is fragile X syndrome. As I said, it's the most common single gene disorder that causes intellectual impairment, infects boys and girls. Um, so don't just test your boys. It belongs to this class of diseases called triplet repeat, called, caused by a triplet repeat. So um, you will recall that the genetic code is made up of triplets and that um, a normal part of a number of genes, um, there's a repeating triplet. So in the case of fragile X, um, it's a CGG, CGG, CGG. Um, and um, as that, if that expands, then that could cause pathology. Now, these triplet repeats are not picked up by microarray or are likely, very unlikely picked up by microarray. They're below the resolution of a chromosome microarray. Um, and because they're repeating elements, um, they're not picked up uh, by and large by next generation sequencing either. Um, simply because that, if you recall, that next generation sequencing relies on aligning a genome to reference genome. And if you've got a genome that repeats, then you're not entirely sure what part of those repeating genomes being aligned. And so um, it's, there, are, there are advanced technologies which are looking uh, very, well, they can overcome that problem, um, but they're not routine. So fragile X needs to be ordered separately. As I mentioned, single organ disease um, in, in primary care is um, not something that you'd be rushing in and doing genetic testing. Um, what you are, as a general practitioner are doing is trying to work out, you know, is a, is a presentation something serious or not? So if a child has uh, recurrent chest infections or wheeze, are you just dealing with childhood asthma or are you dealing with immunodeficiency? If they're talking about a racing heart, you know, are they, you know, worried about their new school um, or is it a serious cardiac dysrhythmia? So, you know, these are um, um, lofty questions, which I'm, you know, glad I don't face at a, on, a daily, on a daily basis. Um, but certainly when you start erring towards something that is serious, then those children get preferred to um, a specialist in that field. Um, and with mainstreaming mob genomics, um, individual specialists are now uh, very literate in the genomics of their own specialty. Um, and so we find that the subspecialists um, are very adept at ordering uh, gene tests within their specialty uh, and interpreting those tests. So I'd leave it to them. Um, if people do if, you know, bring their child along um, thinking like oh, they're not quite right, can we just do a gene wellness screen? I'll, I'd caution against that. And we'll talk about this more next um, week with director consumer testing, but these tests uh, tend to be a little bit of nonsense. Um, finally, um, we spoke about the child being dragged along by the hair into the general practitioner, um, being concerned that the child has a genetic condition. And that could be um, that they, that parent themselves has um, been um, diagnosed with a genetic condition or a more distant family um, member. Um, now, parents, as you know, can be quite um, forthright in requesting this, um, even to the point of demanding that their minor be tested. Um, and it does pay just to remember that parents are biologically programmed to be concerned for their child, to care for their child, to look after their child. Um, and so um, whilst it can be quite confronting to have been in that situation, um, it is a part of the, the parental biology. When looking at a child who is otherwise normal and the parents asking for a, a test to be undertaken, there are two types of testing. Um, the first is called pre-symptomatic test. So pre-symptomatic um, is referring to conditions that if you have the variant, you will get the condition. So the, uh, our adult onset neurodegenerative conditions, Huntington disease being the most common, um, are the ones for which we undertake pre-symptomatic testing. The other um, uh, test is called a predictive test. So, and it's a bit of a misnomer, I have to say, but that's, that's what the literature calls it, it's a predictive test. And so 
it's looking at variants that increase the predisposition for uh, an adult onset condition. And these tend to be uh, mainly the cancer ones. So if you've got a um, mutation or a variant in a tumor suppressor gene, then you're at increased risk of developing cancer. You're actually at quite a high risk of developing cancer, but it's not guaranteed. Um, so so tests that are uh, pre-symptomatic testing of this nature, um, just to differentiate them, are called predictive tests. Um, now, the thing about um, predictive testing is that um, because not everyone with the mutation inherits the condition, um, if a child was brought along because Aunt, Auntie Lisa um, has the BRCA mutation and I want my 15-year-old daughter to be tested for it, just because the mother herself, um, so Auntie Lisa's sister, um, doesn't have breast cancer, you can't be reassuring. You can't say, well, you don't have breast or ovarian cancer, therefore your daughter um, isn't at risk and we won't test her. Um, because uh, of this phenomenon of non-penetrance where the, a person can inherit the, the uh, variant um, and not yet or not at all develop the condition, we can't be that reassuring. Um, as a rule of thumb, with pre-symptomatic and predictive testing, we don't do it in minors, simple as that. So um, if you, if you uh, have trouble um, getting that message across to, to a very forceful parents, then you know, be, feel free to refer them on to your genetic service. Um, the main reasons we do that is because really it, it violates those very core principles of medical, medical ethics. We're dealing with minors who don't have capacity to consent so we're violating their autonomy. We're enforcing upon them a test that they might not necessarily want to have themselves as, a, as an adult. And so we want them to come of age so they can make a um, mature um, and fully informed decision. Um, is it something they want to know? Do they need to get their insurance in order, for instance, before they have such a test? Um, you don't want to take those decisions away from them by forcing them to have a test in childhood. Um, usually the test doesn't result in any good um, um, and then indeed it can cause harm. Um, so if you tell a 15-year-old girl that you're at high risk of having breast cancer and she's just watched her Auntie Lisa die um, a terrible death from breast cancer, that can, of course, be associated with significant psychological uh, morbidity. So we always want to wait until the child reaches maturity themselves. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Predictive testing um, can be undertaken if the condition is, um, uh, is childhood onset and especially if there's an intervention. So something like retinoblastoma, um, for instance, that's not 100% penetrant, but we will offer testing to young children who are at risk of a retinoblastoma mutation because we would actively um, um, uh, surveil them for that um, um, eye tumor and potentially save their lives. Um, and then, Occasionally, if it's a condition that's of a um, childhood onset, but you can't intervene, we'll test for that too. So an example of that might be retinitis pigmentosa, where children can go, or adults for that matter, can go slowly blind. You might want to know if that genetic predisposition positions there um, to, in order for their um, um, eyesight to be monitored in the classroom. Okay, so just in summary, genomics allows us to model analyze all the DNA, not just one gene at a time. Um, it provides fantastic opportunities. We're able to, to screen for recessive conditions and this empowers our patients by providing them choices um, to avoid having offspring um, with serious life-limiting inherited disease. Um, the applications of this technology is broadening um, the number of conditions that we are able to screen for. So those rare things that we wouldn't even think about screening for, for before are now, you know, we're now able to test for quite easily because it's all part of the one test. For people who are already affected with dis disorders, diagnosis is becoming easier and faster. And this is especially the case in rare diseases. We're still uh, learning as we go. So, you know, we do get concerned about finding these variants of uncertain significance or unknown significance. Um, but unless we look and find things and get the, get the data, then you know, we're not going to be able to make unknown or uncertain significance into known significance. Um, so we are still on a bit of a learning trajectory, but I don't think that should um, 
um, hinder us from uh, or put us off from us uh, from ordering genetic tests. Um, I'm pleased to see that funding of testing is catching up to to where the technology is. Um, um, still got a bit of a way to go, but we're uh, very fortunate in Australia, and we're coming um, ahead quite nicely. And so that equity of access for our patients um, is is a very important issue. Um, and so they are, if they are not wealthy enough to order these tests, uh, pay for these tests themselves, then um, we I'm very hopeful that the government will be able to 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 support people. So with that, I'll um, uh, stop talking. One thing um, which I'll um, I'll actually get, I'll circulate for, for people who are in Queensland is how to how to um, get into how to how to refer your patients to your local genetic service. So I didn't do a slide on this, but in, in Queensland we do have a statewide service. It's based at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, or Metro North. Um, and if you just hop onto their website, you'll um, and through the um, refer a patient uh, link, you'll quickly find a referral. Um, um, web page where you can refer online. Um, that's a, a public service and that's a statewide service. So whilst it's based in Brisbane, they do all their specific pediatric work at the children, Queensland Children's Hospital. Then they do uh, regional clinics, um, Townsville, Cairns, Mackay, uh, Rockhampton, Toowoomba uh, primarily. Um, and depending on the nature of the issue that your patient has, they might not necessarily see a doctor um, it's maybe um, an issue that a genetic counsellor is very um, adept at handling under the supervision of a, a clinical geneticist. There are a couple of private um, players in town, not many, um, but there are uh, only two now, I think, based in Brisbane, um, um, who I, I'm happy to give you their details if you'd like to contact me, um, but I won't advertise tonight. Okay. So what I'll do now is I saw a few Slido questions come through as I was talking. Um, and I don't know if my helpful Sabrina's there. Question and answers, here we go. Okay, I found them. So good evening, Mike. Um, what is the viewpoint of the public genetic service of direct-to-consumer testing? <laughs> That's a very good question. So this is the topic for next week's webinar. So direct-to-consumer testing is where patients hop online um, or it can be ordered through um, another provider such as a pharmacy or a naturopath. Um, the, a lot of the direct-to-consumer testing um, is the, the data that they provide is not quality. And so, um, um, they, I think it's be fair to say that public genetic service has a, a, a poor opinion. Now, that's not to say all of it is is, is a poor, um, you know, is, is a poor result that you might get from such a service. But the thing that you might get from them is um, your genetic profile predicts that you're at one point three times relative risk of developing Alzheimer's syndrome, which isn't very helpful. You know, that's something that you know someone might go home and lose a lot of sleep over, thinking that they're. Um, at a high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease when the baseline risk is pretty small um, and then 1.3 times a small number, they're still at a small risk. Uh, but we'll talk about more about that next week if that's okay, Mike. Uh, Chi Hong, good evening. For adults, um, are the indications for testing for family history of what other family? A lot of the indications for testing for family history of melanomas um, or family history of bowel or cancer polyps. Um, so melanoma is a, a difficult one, um, simply because in, in Queensland, we are the melanoma capital of, of the world. And so um, um, melanoma is very common. <laughs> and so, you, and, and, and so it's, it's, I suppose it's not that common to have a family history, but certainly I think with having a family history would be considered a, a potential indication for having a genetic test. One of the um, issues about melanoma is you also ask about bowel cancers and bowel polyps. Um, with melanomas, the surveillance really is um, um, good dermatological screening. So it's not, it's not like there's a polyp in there that you can go, go cut out. And so for someone who's at a high risk, um, we'd be 
sort of saying the same thing we say to everybody who lives in Queensland anyways, you know, slip, slop, slap, avoid the sun, cover up well. If you notice any suspicious lesions, get it seen to, to you early. So um, whilst genetic testing for predisposition to melanomas is there, um, it, it's not as valuable as genetic testing for other cancer conditions. Uh, but certainly if you've got more than one individual, especially if they're first degree relatives with melanoma, I think that would be a good reason to consider genetic testing. Um, whether you use that information to test other family members, you know, the value of that um, is, is questionable. Um, similarly, um, bowel cancers and polyps, there's no one indication. So what our counsellors do is they um, look at a whole heap of data. So they look at who in the family's had bowel cancer, what age did they get bowel cancer, what type of polyps have they got, how many polyps have they got, um, um, who's had things like carcinoma in situ, uh, removed and take a very comprehensive family history and they actually validate as many diagnoses as possible. So that's a lot of work that they undertake, um, um, getting consent to look into people's medical records, getting those medical records and only with all that information um, can you make a valid um, um, judgment as to what's you know, an indication for um, genetic testing for uh, bowel cancer. Having said that, genomics is changing how we are working. And so if I'm sitting there in private practice and I've got a patient who's say 55 who's had bowel cancer, whose grandfather's had bowel cancer, and he goes, I want to know if this is genetic, I'd say to him, sure, let's do it. Um, you know, if you're happy to pay the couple of thousand dollars for a next generation screen, absolutely. And so all that, um, um, I guess, triaging of information that you know, took up a lot of time in the public sector. And I imagine we'll take up less time in the public sector as we put our resources into actual testing rather than working out who should be testing. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot more, a lot more of these tests. Um, so that's a bit of a, a bit of a, a work in progress, but certainly if you go to the public system, sorry, um, they, they, you know, still have to work out where they spend their money. Uh, Kristen asks, how sensitive is the sex chromosome testing in NIPT? Uh, very sensitive. I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but it's in the 90s. Um, so certainly uh, sensitivity and specificity for sex chromosome aneuploidy um, is good. Um, so, but every, anything outside sex chromosome aneuploidy and 13, 21 and 18, um, it's not so good. Um, Mike, again, as genetic Genomic testing improves over time. When would you consider retesting for a patient um, with a possible undiagnosed genetic disorder? Mike, you asked the best questions. Um, so this is actually built into uh, that, that Medicare schedule. So if we do um, sequence all the genes, it could be, and don't find anything, it could be that um, we um, just don't know how to interpret the data. And so there's actually a Medicare item to reanalyze that data. And I, I think I'd have to go back, but I think it has to be within five years of the original test. Um, five years is generally a, a, a good turnaround time, uh, a, a good a break between doing testing. Um, so we've seen that along the way with all of our tests, really. So, you know, back in the old days where we just did a chromosome test, it's normal, come back in five years. Then we had fish testing, that's normal, come back in five years. Then we had um, microarray testing, come back in five years. Um, then we might have a couple of gene disorders that we can test for. No, that's normal, come back in five years. Now we're doing uh, chromosome, whole genome sequencing. So I think we're still at that five year mark. And certainly if my memory of that Medicare schedule, it's only new, so I haven't committed it to memory, Mark, but um, five years is a good time to start. You know, if we haven't found an answer, let's look at this again. Um, so it's not so much so technology improves, so the actual mechanics of how we're sequencing, that doesn't improve. But what's actually more important, arguably, is the bioinformatics, is our ability to, to get into that data or get into those sequencing um, and, and, and find those changes. So that's, that's where we're making lots of, lots of um, 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 progress. So my time's up. So thanks everyone um, for, for participating tonight. Um, I will, um, got, I, I do have a little test for you. It's, it's nothing that you have to, it's not homework you have to hand back into me, but I do encourage you to take a little formative test and we'll email you that link um, tomorrow or the next day um, for you to undertake the, um, a, a test to, to consolidate the things you've learnt and um, 
I've also provided resources. So if you've got any questions on topics, they are there for you to, to follow up on. And again, um, Slido is gonna be live for us, I believe. Um, and so I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. And if questions come through, we can incorporate those in the next webinars. Um, the next one being on the 21st of October, which is adult conditions and direct to consumer testing. And the one after that on cancer genomics, um, which is um, on uh, the 11th of November. So good night, everyone, um, and thanks for your attention tonight.